sparkly dress. <laughs> I look forward to seeing sparkly dress. Um, so next Sunday morning, uh, Pastor Miller's going to be here, and he's going to preach next Sunday morning. And uh, for those of you who have been around the church uh, since before we were here, uh, when, when we bought this property and built this building that we just paid off in October, if you've been around since the old days, you probably know people in the community that are no longer really attending here. Let them know that, that we would love to have them come uh, next Sunday as our, as, as we celebrate, and then that evening at the uh, at the celebration dinner at five o'clock. Uh, open your Bibles this morning. Turn to the book of Matthew, Matthew's Gospel, chapter four. That's where we're going to start again this morning. Um, last Sunday morning, I think it was second service, but last Sunday morning, right up here in the second or third row, the Gogan family was here, and Dylan, uh, who just graduated from high school, was leaving right after church was going down. It was first service, I believe. So in, in this service a week ago, we prayed for the Gogans, and Dylan was leaving for boot camp right after church, went down, stayed in the hotel in Nashville on Sunday night, and then Monday got on the bus, took off for boot camp. I gave Dylan the same speech that I give almost anybody at that phase of life, whether you're packing up your bag and going off to college or packing up your bag and going off to boot camp or whatever, this you're moving away from home for the first time. I give him the same speech because I can't help but give speeches. I say this, when you get there, in his particular case, when you get to boot camp, when you get there, your first few hours, your first few days, look around for good influences, good guys. Specifically, look around for other Christian young men because they are there. Sometimes we think that when we go to work, when we go to school, when we go, that we're the, you're not. <coughs> Dylan, probably nervous, he didn't say, Pastor Rich, I'm very nervous, but probably nervous to get on a bus, to go off and start this new chapter in his life. It's not going to be like home anymore. Go look for Christian friends because the idiots will find you. Amen. In the fall of 1988, I bought a footlocker and put all my stuff in a footlocker and I went off as a freshman, 17 years old, to Wofford College, Spartanburg, South Carolina, USA. And I hit, I hit Wofford. It was awesome. First night I was there. First night I was there. God just kind of handcrafted some really good, especially guys, really good guys, Christian guys, a Christian organization. God put a bow on that and put a tag that says, too rich from Jesus, basically. God gave me really good influences that first night I was at school. The next day, the frat boys knocked on my door. And I went off with them. And that led down a road that I don't tell a lot of stories about right now. But the idiots will find you. It is overwhelmingly important who we surround ourselves with. And that just doesn't happen automatically. Part of that is our effort who we end up with. We, we, last week, we started a series called Discipleship Habits. Habits. What do disciples of Jesus have in common? What are some of the things that we do to better know and better follow Jesus? We celebrate when people start that journey. We become believers. We celebrate that moment, but then there is a lifelong walk with Jesus we call discipleship, being like him, being his follower, 
There's a lifelong, and what do those healthy, mature disciples, what do they have in common? So we start that look really today, and we'll start back where we started last week in Matthew chapter 4, and it starts like this, Matthew 4 verse 18, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Jesus says, come follow me. Now, two weeks from today, we're going to unpack those words, because those words mean more than just, hey, fellas, follow me. There's more there. We're going to look at that in a couple of weeks. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once, they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing the nets. Jesus called them, come follow me. And immediately they left their boat and their father, and they followed him. Jesus called them not for a day trip. Hey, guys, do you have a couple of hours? He didn't call them to a service. Let's go to church together. Let's sing some songs. Let's shake some hands. Let's give an offering. Let's read from the word, and then we'll go on about our lives. Jesus called them to a three-year deep dive into his life. Discipleship is not a 10 sheets of paper, fill in the blank Bible study. Discipleship isn't just showing up to church here every once in a while. Discipleship is a daily decision to walk in the steps of Jesus. And we're going to look at that a little bit closer in a couple of weeks. I want you to turn to the book of Acts now. Acts chapter 2, and we're going to start right after Pentecost, okay? Jesus, after his earthly ministry, he's gone to the cross. He rose again three days later, and after, uh, after 50 days, he goes back to the Father. After, 40, after 50 days, the Holy Spirit comes, and the church is born. The Holy Spirit comes on the first day. Church, a group of believers, the Holy Spirit comes and gives them power. And Peter goes out and he preaches a sermon because that's what Peter did. He goes out and he preaches a sermon. And at the very end of his sermon, Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 37, when the people heard Peter's sermon talking about Jesus and the fact that Jesus had gone to the cross and he rose again and the spirit had come on them and given them power. At the very end of Peter's message, when the people heard this, verse 37, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? What do we do now? And that, that's really one of the questions that set up all this that we're going to talk about over these next few weeks. If I am a believer in Jesus, or if I want to be a believer in Jesus, what do you do next? What are the things that people who have a faith in Christ and, and are walking with him, what do true disciples have in common? What do we do? Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you. That's where we start. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Skip down to verse 41. Those who accepted Peter's message were baptized, and about 3,000 people were added to that number. That morning, how many people were in the upper room? 120. The Holy Spirit comes and gives them power. That night at bedtime, there were 3,000 new believers. What did those 3,000 people... Go back. What do we do? What do you tell those 3,000 people with brand new faith in Jesus? What do we do? Well, thank you for asking. Verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer, 
We're going to be talking about some of these things over the next few weeks. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together. Big word. All the believers were together and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and together uh, ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Every day, they met together. Every day they met together. Every day they met together. Do you know how often we meet together? Periodically. We have services every Sunday morning. That's not every day. Every day the early church met together. If they met together daily, if they needed to be together, who needed to be together? 3,000 brand new believers. What do we do? Well, you need to come back tomorrow. We need to keep talking. See, if all we want is a tick mark, okay, they prayed a prayer and we dunked them and now they were, they were dry, now they're wet, and boom, boom, you know, we're done, and they now can go to heaven. Then we'd just be done. Jesus didn't call them to that. Jesus didn't call the disciples, Peter and Andrew and James and John and all the others, and say, guys, hey, here's, here's what you should believe. You should believe that, right? 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 You should believe that. Good. Pray this prayer. Repeat after me. Now let's do baptism. And now here's your certificate. Now you can go to heaven. That's not what Jesus called people to. 3,000 brand new believers, they began to meet together. Discipleship, folks, is not informational. It's relational. It's not informational. It's relational. It's us together. The key word here is community. We, we sang a minute ago about the creed. Our creed, our statement of belief. Do you know what the creed's first word is? We. It's not, I believe, I, Rich Cook, I believe these things. Good for me. I have beliefs. My beliefs are better than your beliefs. I believe, so now I can be with Jesus someday. It's we together. Discipleship, belief is just you, what you can do between your two ears. I believe a certain thing. Nod your head. That's great. But discipleship, knowing Christ, is to daily walk with him. And we're going to give you more things over these next few weeks. We're going to give you more of these habits, the habits of discipleship. You and me, we need to be in constant community. How good of a marriage would I have if I just saw Dana for an hour and 15 minutes once a week? You, you neither. If we're building relationship, if we're building a bond, if we're building a bond, we need constant communi communion. We need community. It matters. We're called not for informational belief systems. We're called to discipleship. And folks, you can't do that with a six-week Beth Moore Bible study. Not to pick on Beth Moore. You can't do that with a Henry Blackaby Bible study either. Okay, we can't just do that with one little course we take. You know, you want to be a church member? Good, we'll do your little church member class. Chick, chick. Okay, here's your certificate. Well, good, that's another step. But discipleship is a lifelong building of community. You need someone walking a little bit in front of you. Remember Paul? Remember Saul? Book of Acts, Saul? Uh, a Pharisee persecuting Christians. Jesus shows up, knocks him off his horse, or that's always been my picture, okay? Gets his attention. Who goes to bat for him? A guy named Barnabas. Every Paul needs a Barnabas, a little bit in front of you. You can read about him in Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 11, bar, uh, the relationship between Paul and Barnabas. Paul was, the, Paul, Paul is a big, 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 big shot in the New Testament, but he wouldn't have been who he was without a Barnabas mentoring him and guiding him. Every Paul, you need a Barnabas, somebody a little bit 
older in the faith, somebody a few steps out in front of you who is working with you, discipling you. Every Paul needs a Silas, someone walking with them. Every Paul needs a Timothy, someone walking a little bit behind them, but you are walking with them, you're discipling. So I ask you, who is discipling you? Who's discipling you? You're here on a Sunday morning. Awesome. Good. Good, good, good. Keep doing that. But if the only time I talked to Dana was once a week on Sunday morning from 9.30 to 10 to 10.45, then we would not have a great relationship. Who is discipling you? The first 3,000 believers there in the book of Acts on the first day of the church... They devoted themselves daily to coming together, to being with each other, to learning more about Jesus. It's not just informational, it's relational. Every Paul needs a Barnabas, somebody who's a little out in front of them. Every Paul needs a Silas, someone beside them. Every Paul needs someone they're discipling, Timothy, someone just a little bit behind them as they are grow, as they are bringing them on now let me switch gears church hear me turn to the end of the book of Matthew Matthew chapter 28 Again, we looked at this last week. Chapter 28, after the crucifixion and resurrection, Jesus looks at his disciples and he says this, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples. He said to his disciples, go make more disciples. Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them. You don't teach people by giving them a piece of paper. Here, do this and you'll be golden. That is a daily, week after week, month after month, year after year, building of relationship. If we are going to be a disciple-making church, no telling the kind of people that are going to show up. Don't be surprised when people not quite like you come around. From day one to day 100 to day 10,000, new and learning disciples are going to make messes and make mistakes. New disciples, new believers aren't finished products. I don't think you heard me, so I'll say it again. New disciples, learning disciples aren't finished products, and neither are you, and neither am I. I was brought up in church. I think I was born on a Tuesday, probably by Sunday or the next Sunday I was in church. I was in church in the old days when it was Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and any revival meeting within a three-county area. So I was a children's church, children's camp, teen camp, VBS, youth group. I, that was my life. And I've known Jesus now for a long time. And I am not a finished product. Ask Dana. I'm not done quite yet. And if I'm not done, I'm not sure that you're done. And I will still make messes. You know how I know? Because I've watched some of you. You all make messes. Another preacher, not me, another preacher said, man, this job would be awesome if it wasn't for all the people. <laughs> we make mistakes none of us are finished products so let me tell you as we kind of come in for landing this morning let me tell you and I saw this video again this week I've seen a similar I've seen a similar thought before and before I tell you this story I want to just tell you don't hear what I'm not saying don't hear what I'm not saying but I watched a video this week of another pastor who said it like this. Another pastor telling the story said, a kid came up to him in his church and said, Pastor, do I have to stop smoking weed to be a Christian? And the pastor responds, no. 
By the way, that's not the sermon I heard back in the 80s. <laughs> and the kid was confused, and so he said, Do I have to stop smoking marijuana <laughs> to be a Christian? And the pastor said, No. And the kid said, I don't understand. <laughs> And the pastor said, no, you don't. We come to Jesus, no barriers. And along the way, we become more like him. Along the way, day one, you're not a finished product. I don't know what day I'm on, but I'm on day way down the line now. I'm not a finished product. I am becoming more like him. We call that holiness, sanctification. He is working in me and working out in me. Jesus is bit by bit making me more like the rich that he created me to be. But I'm not where I need to be yet. I'm not what I was, but I'm not where I need to be yet. So if we say, people, come, come, follow Jesus. We are following Jesus, and they come, and they're a little bit wackadoodle. We're good with that. So somebody in here right now is going, Rich, we can't have those folks around here. Well... What if it was my kid? What if it was your kid? Somebody that you're praying for to know Jesus. It's your kid, your grandkid. And right now they're out there and they don't know Christ. How many barriers do you want us to put between them where they are and being in the presence of Jesus? How many barriers? Let's name those barriers. Zero. Come. As broken and sinful as you are, come. Do you know why? We need community. We need to be together. I need people in my life that are a little bit further down the line than I am. Older brothers in Christ that I spend time with, that I learn from, that I give the green light to look at me and say, Rich, this in your life? We need to look at that. Is this lifting up Jesus? If, is this drawing you closer to Jesus or is this hindering your walk? I need people who are walking with me, beside me. I need to see others who are younger in their faith and be a part of the solution, drawing them to Christ. We believe, we. Rich, what do we do with this? Who's discipling you? There in the book of Acts, Peter goes out and he preaches a sermon and 3,000 new believers are added. Who's discipling them? You today, if you're taking your first step toward Christ this morning, and we're going to go to the table in a minute and we're going to invite you, if you would like to come, take maybe your very first step toward Jesus today. Then what? you need to take those next steps. One of those next steps is being here on Sundays. One of those next steps is being in community. Another is being a part of a group. We have Sunday school classes. If you're a Sunday morning person, we have small groups that meet periodically. We have men's groups, women's groups. If we don't have a group that fits you, make a group. <coughs> Make a group, look around for somebody like you and say, I want to know Jesus better. Can we do this together? Back last year when, when I was thinking about this series and thinking about the, the, the habits of discipleship, I thought, okay, what do we do? What do we do first? What do we do first? You know, there's a thousand things that Christians should do. You know, you should read your Bible and you should pray and you should give and you should serve and all those good things. And what I settled on was we actually mostly need to be together. That's not just on Sunday mornings. Folks, you need somebody walking with you, who's coaching you, who's helping you, who's teaching you, sometimes correcting you, but mostly they are your fan club. They are encouraging 
and loving on you with the love of Jesus. Do we need all those other things? Yes, we'll get to them. But we do that together. Jesus didn't say, here's some stuff to believe. Believe this. He said, follow me. And we don't do that for an afternoon. We don't do that for a long weekend. We do that for the rest of our lives. The early church met together daily. If they needed it, we probably need it too. We're going to pray, and then we're going to come to the table. But would you stand with me? Let's pray together. And as I pray today, I want you to ask yourself the question. I asked this last week. Am I a believer? If you're not, we can take that next step. Am I a believer? Or am I a disciple? I might be a baby disciple. I might be a disciple who wants to be close. But am I going to be a mere believer and just stay there? Or am I going to give my life to Jesus in following him and be a disciple of him and be with others? Pray with me. Lord, help us all to give our individual lives to you, but also to the body, to the family, to walking together. Every one of us needs community. None of us are finished products. We need to be together, not just on Sunday mornings, but we need to be together with each other. And because of technology, we can do that. We can, we can text each other, talk to each other. We can do Bible studies together. We don't even have to be in the same space. But God, we need Jesus with skin on him sometimes. And I need Christian friends walking with me. I need encouragement. I need help. I need correction. I need somebody who can answer some of my questions. I need somebody who is cheering me on as I follow you, Jesus. And if I need that, I'm pretty sure the rest of us need that too. Help us to seek out that next step. Draw us together. Draw us into community. In your great name we pray. Amen. So, like a family, we come to the table. And at the table we talk, we laugh, we build relationship, and again, we tell the story of Jesus. And I'd like to invite you this morning to come to the table, and let me, let me say this. This isn't just bread and juice. We come and we receive the body and the blood of Jesus, and if you're a new believer this morning, if you'd like to be, you're welcome at the table. If you're not, it's okay. No, no judgment. You can, you can sit this one out. I'd still encourage you to keep coming. But I'd like to invite you to come to the table. The, the, the meal is for his disciples. And if you're not one this morning, you can be. You can come. 